The appointed hour is 6.30 having been reached. I welcome everybody to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020, order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the Town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on a link on the town's webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of the regular members of the ZBA who have been impaneled for consideration of the items on tonight's agenda. Steve Judge is me, I'm here. Mr. Langsdale? Here. Ms. O'Meara? Here. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. And Associate ZBA members, Ms. Sharon Waldman? I'm here. Mr. Barrick, Mr. Greeny, Mr. Meadows. Also in attendance is Maureen Pollock, Christine Brestrup, and David Waxhevitz. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board may seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. I want to remind applicants, my fellow board members, and the public to seek recognition from the chair before speaking. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. The following is a statutory timeline for ZBA actions on comprehensive permits. Within 40 days from closing of the public hearing, the ZBA must render a decision, denial, approval, or approval with conditions based on a majority vote. Within 14 days of its decision, the ZBA must file a copy with the town clerk. And within 20 days from the date that the ZBA decision is filed with the town clerk, the public can appeal the ZBA's decision. I want to review the ways in which the public can be informed about and comment on this application in addition to these public hearings. Residents can sign up to be notified of any additional information recorded by the town concerning this application through the notify, notify me feature on the town website. Copies of all submissions can be found on the town website. Go to the ZBA page, Click on, the, click on the link for 132 Northampton Road, and that link will bring you to a page which will allow you to navigate all the public information regarding this application. Public comments can be submitted on the 132 Northampton Road page or an email to Maureen Pollock, planner at pollockm Pollock at amherstma.gov. 
Amherst Media will not be broadcasting tonight's hearing. However, check their website for information on when it will be rebroadcast, or you can view a recording of this meeting on the town's YouTube channel. Tonight's agenda is as follows. A public hearing to consider ZBA FY 2020-39, Valley Community Development Corporation, 132 Northampton Road. Request a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40B, to construct a new two and a half story residential multifamily building located containing 28 small studio apartments and related common areas on an approximate 88 one hundredths acre property located at 132 Northampton Road, map 14C, parcel eight, general residence, RG, and educational ED zoning districts. This meeting is continued from September 10th, 2020. Items in, on the agenda are as follows. Responses from the September 10th questions from the board to the applicant. Discussions on the density of housing of the proposed project. The applicant will present site amenities, architectures, and layout. We will have a public time for public comment. The board will also continue its compiling list of questions, requests, and possible conditions, and other items that the ZBA chair deems appropriate. As always, we will have a public comment period at the end of the meeting. The public may comment on any matter that is not before the board tonight. And of course, any other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. We have a full agenda and I intend to provide time for public comment. If by nine, we have not finished with the presentation and questions for the board, we will dedicate time for public comment at our next meeting on this application in two weeks. Since the September 10th public hearing, the board has received the following submissions. A PowerPoint presentation from the applicant responding to questions from the board at our last meeting and on other matters and public comments, an anonymous comment uh, submitted via the town website dated September 11th, and a second anonymous comment submitted via the town website dated September 15th. The first item on the agenda is the answers to the questions we asked at our August or at our September 10th meeting. Before we begin, I wanna mention something. We received a almost 50 page PowerPoint presentation from the applicant this morning. I'm in a position that I can dedicate this, my day of the board meeting to reviewing that submission. Several of my fe fellow board members work and cannot dedicate sufficient time to reviewing the submission if it is presented to us on the day of the public hearing. Our last meeting was two weeks ago and Valley CDC should have submitted their presentation sometime in the la sometime last week. I understand that Valley CD is a nonprofit organization and this application is a tremendous amount of work. But we all need to be able to fulfill our responsibilities to fully review all the information we receive. We are also trying to complete our consideration of this matter by the end of October. So if Valley can't provide the submissions several days in advance of the public meeting, you have to let us know. We have to balance our desire to move forward in a reasonable time frame, and at the same time, carry out our responsibilities to the town in a prudent manner. With that being said, um, Ms. Baker, are you representing uh, Valley today? I will be starting us off, yes. That would be great. Just identify yourself for the record. Sure, uh, my name is Laura Baker. I'm the Real Estate Project Manager for Valley Community Development Corporation. We're located at 256 Pleasant Street in Northampton. Um, and we want to tender our apology to the board for the late submission of materials. Um, we'll do better next time. Thank you. Sure. So we have your PowerPoint presentation has two answer to our two questions that we uh, submitted from last week's meetings. What I would like to do is deal with each of those separately and then okay. move on to the other items on the agenda. So sure. um, if you, you can proceed and um, deal with the first question, which I think dealt with um, the smoking area. Right. So I don't see an opportunity to share screen yet, uh, Maureen. You don't? You don't have that option? Oh, wait a second. It's coming. Hmm. Hmm. 
Sorry, folks, I am not seeing the thing that I need to share. Uh, all right, let me check my, uh, Rachel, uh, or anyone from your team, do you see the option to share? I, I have to share all panelists, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm checking my settings and panelists can share. Uh, Um, well, I can certainly share my screen, so bear with me. Okay, thanks a lot. While we're doing that, I do want to mention that John Witten, who is the outside counsel to the board for this matter, has joined us. Nate Malloy has also joined us. He's with the planning department. All righty. Um. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, can I forward it or do I need to tell you to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'm gonna have to woman this. Okay, <laughs> next slide. So uh, one of the things that we talked at some length about at the last meeting was trying to find a, an appropriate best case scenario location for um, a smoking area on the site. And this slide is showing you what we actually covered last time, which was the original proposed location, which is right here. And then the second proposal to have to designate the entire property as smoke free. Uh, and we talked a bit about the pros and cons of those two options. So next slide. So on this slide, you'll see a couple of other potential locations. There's location C here and location D here. And I don't know, Rachel, if you can run through the pros and cons um, of these different spots. Sure, yeah. Location C is similar to a location that was uh, suggested previously. Um, it is just outside of the stormwater area, which is outlined in that, in that green outline. Um, it's off the corner of the building. Um, but it, it does kind of fall within the front yard zone just barely. Um, and one thing that we had been trying to do is keep uh, these supporting structures out of the front yard because that looks more like an institution and not like a residence. Um, but in that corner, we could screen it with some vegetation. Um, another, another pro is that it's away from the residential neighbor to the east um, and it's away from Amherst College track. The con though is that it's really close to our air intake area. Um, we have our ERV air intake on the front, the front of the facade facing Northampton Road. So that's where our air coming into the building is coming from. Um, and then alternative D was suggested by a member of the community. Um, again, if we, if we follow the structure, a similar structure to what was proposed before, um, this, would, this would not really look like a residential setting. However, um, the team got together and brainstormed a little bit um, and we think we could provide an alternative seating area with say in the images in the lower left hand part of the screen that show an arbor um, that could be planted with vines and a, a bench of some sort in front of it um, that would feel a little bit more residential and garden scale in that location. Um, the pros there is that it might be more fitting with the character of the neighborhood um, and it'd be perceived as a garden element. Um, the con is that it's highly visible in the front yard. So let's do the next one and then we can have more discussion maybe about the different options. Um, and then another alternative would be uh, location E, which is directly across the main entry of the building, but really close to the neighbor and within the setback. Um, the con there obviously being is that they were um, much closer to the neighbor um, and then it uh, um, is closer to the neighbor and that also someone would have to cross the parking lot to get to the smoking shelter. Um, the pros are that it's not in the front yard, um, it's back from the face of the building, 
Um, it's away from the patio area and it's away from the ERV handling unit. Um, another location is location F in the, the rear corner of the property behind the patio. Um, the pros are that it's not within view of Northampton Road at all. Um, and it's away from the residential neighbor to the east. It's away from the ERV intake. However, it's closer to Amherst College track and closer to the parking area for Amherst College. So I was going to make a suggestion that it, as a way to kind of organize a conversation might be to think about the preferred location without thinking originally or thinking then after that about the, the style of the structure. So um, we wouldn't want something in the front yard that looks like a bus shelter. So we would want to modify what that type of structure would look like. Um, but I kind of think that's something we could do once we came to some kind of consensus about what's the best overall location. Then we could design something suitable for that location. And of course, we could bring that back to the board as well. So one of the things that Rachel um, tried to outline on, on here is distances from different things. So, you know, distance to the nearest window, distance to the nearest door. Um, it, we weren't thinking that distance to the building was necessarily the most critical measure. It seemed like distance to the openings into the building was, was probably more relevant. And then also the distance to where we have our fresh air intake seemed um, pretty important to us as well. So I guess that that's a good way. That's a good way to proceed is to talk about the areas and not not spend our time right now on the design of the yeah the, the shelter or the bench. So, are there comments from the board on any of the um, six, five, or six uh, potential locations? Mr. Chair. Yep. Mr. Maxfield? Uh, yeah, so again, I'm still uh, very much partial to A. I like A the most. Um, but if any of those other options there, option E, uh, I, I also like, but kind of on the condition of, I know there was some discussion of, I don't think we ever totally settled the discussion on what's happening with those trees and putting up of a fence. Um, but I know if a fence was going in there, uh, those trees were moving a, and an at least eight foot fence was put there. Uh, I would also support E and I'd like to hear from the rest of the board, but I, uh, one thing I know this will be you know, voted on in conditions, but I hope we can at least reach a consensus about this tonight. So that way, if we all agree, you know, E is the place they can, they can come back to us with a design and then we, we, we can all just kind of agree on that. But uh, I, I'm, I'm partial to, to A and E as an alternative. Uh, I'm like, what everyone else has to think about that. Other, com other comments? Tammy and Ms. Parks. Um, so you were talking about the um, air intake that um, C uh, would be close to that air intake, but the feeling is that D is far enough away from that. It seems, I mean, it's a little farther away. It doesn't seem a lot farther away to me, would it, but that would make a difference. The, yeah. the farther away we can get from it, the better. Um, I'm going to ask Tom if he can just talk for a minute about how high we think those units would be on the face of the building and whether there is an opportunity. We haven't gotten to the stage where we've done final mechanical drawings, but the initial ones place the air intakes here, um, whether those could be relocated somewhere else. All right, and um, I and also um, I guess I I can't remember exactly why A was not acceptable. It was that it was too close to the building in some interpretations. Is that correct? That there was a a, a building restriction, or am I misunderstanding? There, there's no there's no restriction per se, but my memory is that there was concern that it was too close to the building, and potentially too close to this property line here. All right. Um, I, I also, I, I guess I would agree with Dylan that A and E would be my preferred positions. I just want to throw that out there. Any other comments? Mr. Langsdale? Yeah, uh, a couple. Um, a is um, 
uh, not conducive because it's only 11 feet from the building and therefore uh, close to uh, three stories of windows, uh, which can be opened. Um, and it's right next to the um, uh, the planting, the gardening thing. It's six feet away from the gardening. Um, one of the things that that could happen since since the um, introduction of benches is that you could move a like nine feet back and put a bench or two there, um, which would move it uh, 20 feet away, at least 20 feet away from the, uh, the building and from the, and 15 feet away then from the, uh, the gardening area. Um, e could certainly work uh, again, maybe with just a couple of benches. There's also a place uh, if, if the uh, air intake cannot be moved, um, I mean, C would be a great area if, if the air intake could be moved. However, if it can't be, then it's probably too close. There is, however, a, another area, I think, that would work, <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, northeastern ed, uh, <laughs> excuse me, northeastern area under, there's a couple of trees there uh, just outside the stormwater uh, area. And there could be a couple of benches put there. And I know that they were talking about uh, keeping uh, things out of the front yard zone. However, um, one of the pictures that they have provided shows the, um, oh gosh, I forget the name of the house. The, the Sergeant. One the one in Northampton, which has a bench right up against the fence, which is like a foot or two at most away from the sidewalk. If this, if they had a couple of benches under these trees in the front yard zone, they would be further away than that bench is at the other house. Um, so I don't see the, what the objection would be to having benches in the front uh, yard zone uh, since they've already done that. Uh, in another building. Um, so I would say uh, A, for me, A is uh, uh, at the moment with the pavilion and everything um, is not viable. Uh, it's too close to the building and to the gardening uh, areas. Um, e, certainly, and then this other uh, area in the front yard zone where there could be a couple of benches. Um, yes, Mr. Maxfield, and then I'd like to go to Ms. O'Meara if she has a question, if she has a comment. Go ahead, Mr. Maxfield. I'm, I'm sorry, I just wasn't entirely clear. This is uh, for uh, Keith Langsdale. Uh, where exactly on in the front yard zone um, were you pointing to? And then you said northeastern area, but were you referring to uh, compass-wise? Uh, that's you mean that's west. Park? It's near the, near the parking area. The southwest. No, no, that's west. No, northwest. Over here, up by the where it says Amherst College. I well, think you mean. The, the, no. This this is no. north, north. Just so you know. So if you look at this compass right here, this is north. So which? Go which, in. Go a little bit west. No, no, not under the storm water. Now, now just down right there. Are two trees right there. Oh. As it's, I mean, they don't. They don't have to be those two trees. <laughs> Uh, whatever they're going to plant there, but that area uh, could certainly be used uh, and it's away from everything except the sidewalk, but it's not right up against the sidewalk uh, as the bench is at the other house uh, that they have. <clears throat> Ms. O'Meara, do you have um, an opinion? Um, I, I'm listening to Keith's idea and I kind of like that. Um, I don't like E because I'm not sure what's happening with those trees and I don't want the neighbors to have smoke floating their way, um, even though with Keith's proposal, it could still float their way, but that's a ways up the hill. Yeah. And 
my my opinion is that uh, a modified A, uh, perhaps moving a little bit farther away, would not be bad. It may we may be able to get consensus around that. Um, D may work. Nobody else has mentioned that one. Um, the only problem I see with um, the new suggestion from Mr. Langsdale is that it's a long ways, um, or it's not, it's not, it's a short ways from the road and it may not be, it may not be sheltered from the road, but I think that um, I can go with almost whatever the majority would um, vote for on this. It's, I, I think we're getting into the weeds here. We should solve this, give them some directions tonight, but not, um, and then hope they come back, give them some directions so that they can come back with a, with a design. Mr. Chairman, may I add yeah. a few comments? Yeah. So um, the garden areas, which are here, and there's some here, and there's some here, are one of the more fungible elements in terms of where you can put garden beds. So I wouldn't, some things are easier to move around than others. And I think gardening areas are one of the easier things to kind of shift around on a site. Um, yeah. I would say we were really trying to stay away from, this is the main outdoor space for residents. And we really didn't want to have this bench be so close to it that if you're a non-smoker and you're outside, you're heavily impacted by other people smoking. I will speak uh, for the abutter here, who I assume is on the call but may not be, was very, very concerned about smoke, really almost, I think, on any this side of the property. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had neighbors and abutters who used the track who felt like just the combination of smoke and people running was just a kind of a bad combination. So I just want to share with you some of the constraints that we've heard, some of the things that we've been trying to work around. Um, the image that we shared for Sergeant House, um, can you show that, Maureen? I think it's the next page is an example of something where we had much less room to work with. Hold, hold on, sorry. It has like a delayed. Um... Um, and what it shows is that the, the smoking air is actually um, quite a bit closer than 25 feet to the building because that's what there is. Um, you know, we happen to have, this is a historic district, so we happen to have a historic fence here. And so the bench kind of ended up here. It's actually working really well. And I would say that when people are sitting here and you're driving by, you really don't see them. And even when you're walking by, it's kind of a brief encounter that you have with the smell of smoke. Um, and so it's working pretty well. Um, I, I would wanna, I, I hate to put people like on display, smoking in front of a building. So this achieved that. I would wanna achieve the same thing in Amherst where we're not creating you know, any kind of stigma that people are sitting out smoke. Oh, that's the building where people are sitting out smoking. We want to kind of give some visual buffer um, between the main road and people when they're out smoking. I think that's all I had to add. So perhaps if I'll propose not a decision, but I'll propose a direction for you to go and then I'll see if my fellow board members want to follow this. It seems like we had several people like a with the mod and with Keith, uh, Mr. Langdale's modification of moving it a little bit farther away from the building. And if you say you can move the gardening a little bit away from, if you can move that away from the, the smoking area. Yeah. You haven't impacted the neighbors. You haven't impacted the, 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 the event. You are not against the track. You're not in the front yard where they are, um, um, where they'd be seen by the street. Uh, it seems to me that that would be a good option to come back to the board with. Um, I would think that having a second option is also probably helpful to you, but I would, if, the, if my board members, fellow board members feel that that is a good resolution for the, at least the first option, we could, could um, indicate that to you. So Ms. Parks, do you think that's a good idea? All right, there's one. Mr. Langsdale, can you live with that? Uh, no, I would like, um... I would like the area that I talked about to be um, uh, also investigated because. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Because they've already got, they've already got this one the sergeant house where that they put a bench right up against the sidewalk. 
So to have a cup, a bench or two in this area, it wouldn't be up, it, first of all, it wouldn't be up against the, the fence or, and near this, that near the sidewalk. Yes, there would be people uh, smoking in that area, but if you change the vegetation, you can certainly block that. Mm -hmm. um, two very tall trees may not be the way to go. It may be a change of vegetation. But what it does is it takes it, it, takes it completely away from the building, away from the residential neighbors to the north, I mean, to the east. Um, and the, uh, if, if people don't, notice or, or people aren't bothered by it at the sergeant house when it's right up against the the sidewalk they're not going to be uh, uh bothered by it if it's you know 10 or 15 feet away from the sidewalk and then the the road is wide enough that people driving by once and then anybody on the other side the abutters on the other side will probably never even know that people are there smoking it just seems to me that it's it's, it's a very viable uh, place to, to put it so that it's completely away from the building, away from the gardening, away from the patio, away from the uh, abutters to the north, to the east, and away from the Amherst College parking lot track, all of it. Mr. Maxfield? Uh, yeah, if, if uh, let's say if the abutter there has expressed they do not want smoking, especially right on that property line, uh, E is out for me. I definitely support A, um, even if we just moved it to the other side of the sidewalk, moving it slightly further away, I, I support that as well. And Ms. O'Meara? Um, I am liking Keith's idea again of, of creating a barrier with trees or shrubs so that folks are not totally exposed to visibility from the street. I do think there could be plantings there as well. Um, and is this gonna be a covered enclosed space? So we had originally proposed a simple bench, kind of like the one that you did see at Sergeant House. So we what happens when it's raining and so, snowing? So we had neighbors, people use umbrellas. So when we had neighbors suggest that it should be covered, we added something kind of like that little post and beam pavilion that you've seen images of. That seemed appropriate for the side of the building. It might not read as well right in the front yard. And so that's why we're trying to nail down location because if I was putting something personally right in the front yard of a very traditional kind of classic looking house, I would want it to fit and I would want it to sit lighter because you don't see pavilions and gazebos and things typically in front of in front yards it's just it's atypical so we would look to do a trellis or just something that would would sit more lightly on the property than if it's really kind of pretty well sheltered and tucked over here so I'm, I'm going to try to end the discussion if we can I think you've gotten we've gone from six possibilities to two I think that's a, we're not going to make a decision tonight I think we've given you some direction. It'd be helpful if at the next meeting you come back with what yeah. you do it in, in A and um, and the new, or I guess we've had seven possibilities. A and the new possibility, and see what you can come up with. It's Is G. That, okay, yeah, call, we can call it G. G. Yes. All right. Thank you. I think we can we can work we can around with these that. and bring you something back. Right. Good. Let's move on to the next. The ref tenant referral and selection process. I'm gonna hand it over to Jane, um, who's gonna talk about this. Uh, good evening, Chairman and Board Members. Um, so- Just identify yourself for the record, Ms. Leckler. Jane Leckler, Valley Community Development, 256 Pleasant Street, Northampton. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, uh, in our previous meeting, we were discussing the selection um, plan and the procedures for screening criteria and tenant selection. And um, so as the, the first lines here are just repeating, you know, the summary of how we described how an applicant's rental history, credit history, references, interview and follow-up communication are part of how um, uh, an applicant is assessed or suitability for a site. 
Um, we got in and then um, we also discussed that an applicant needs to cooperate with and provide information and documentation to support their eligibility and background check. So during that discussion, the board members had asked about um, exceptions and um, type, types of alternatives or situations that come up during the screening process. So we've collected some information to describe uh, what happens in those situations and some of the regulations around that. Next slide. Thanks. So first, I just wanted to describe the regulatory guidance related to screening criteria that is used in all affordable housing projects uh, that are publicly funded. So the industry resource for this guidance is the HUD Occupancy Handbook 4350.2. This is a regulatory guide and that guidance will be applied as it is across Valley's properties um, that are managed uh, by HMR. Uh, this uh, guidance is used and applied to the entire tenant selection plan and screening criteria for the proposed property. This is required because we are uh, publicly funded. So HUD's guidance on selection plans and screening criteria is built on three primary aims. First, and the quotes are from 4350.2, the, the uh, occupancy manual. First, it must be consistent with the purpose of improving housing opportunities. Second, it must be reasonably related to program eligibility. Third, it must address an applicant's ability to perform the obligations of the lease. I will say that it is not at all uncommon when applicants are interested in a property, either at lease up when there tends to be a lot of you know, interest in um, marketing happening and a large group of people interested, but also just ongoing with operations. It's not at all uncommon that applicants will ask property management ahead of time to see if something from their history is gonna be a cause for them to be rejected. And property management at, um, in order to be in adherence with fair housing law, will not respond to those inquiries as single items. They will encourage people to apply because their application will be viewed as a whole. And because the process that uh, we started to describe last time and I'm gonna describe a little more tonight, um, will be used to evaluate them. Next slide. So here's some excerpts. I'm not going to read all of this, but what I wanted to point out were just a few highlighted phrases that are leading up to our description of how um, uh, exceptions might come up during this process. So these are excerpts from the HUD Occupancy Handbook. Uh, this section is about screening for credit history. And the two things I just wanted to point out here, um, uh, you have the materials, um, but uh, you know, to read every word of it, but um, Examining an applicant's credit history is typically a part of a big part of screening in market rate housing. Um, in affordable housing, it is one piece and only one piece. It is not the primary piece, but we do look at credit history. Um, but a credit check is, is a part of what's happened happens as a background check. And while an owner can reject an applicant for poor credit history, a lack of credit history is not sufficient grounds to reject someone. Secondly, the guidance states that uh, the written screening criteria in order to ensure that everyone is treated fairly should be described as general criteria that will be used for distinguishing between an acceptable and unacceptable credit rating. It goes on to say that a perfect credit rating is generally too strict of a standard around credit history. Next slide. Also, it goes on to say that uh, owners can, uh, owners, managers are the same. Uh, I just wanna make sure that that's clear to folks. Um, managers work for us as agents. Um, Bally is the owner, HMR would be the agent or property manager. Um, so we can look at how far back in a overall uh, screening criteria, we would look at a, an applicant's credit history, but typically we look at more recent history, which is the past three to five years. It is um, good practice to look at more current activity rather than older activity because sometimes, you know, people's lives have changed and we're looking for recent um, evidence of suitability. So then it goes on to have a section on screening for rental history and rental history. Similarly, owners cannot reject an applicant for not having rental history, but can be 
uh, can reject an applicant for having poor rental history. Again, as part of the written screening criteria, owners should describe the general criteria they will use for distinguishing acceptable or unacceptable rental history. Next slide. So what I've done here is give an example. Uh, the board was looking for examples of um, exceptions, but I'm just trying to lay the groundwork here to describe how those exceptions are um, handled. But this would be sample written criteria that if you were an applicant, you would see this list of items and you would know that this would be what um, you would, your screening would involve. So it's a very high level list. It does not go into details of every single um, time period or the actual bar that is set for each of those. Um, and we'll go on to describe a little bit more about the process and how it supports this type of a list of criteria. Next slide. So that, uh, as I mentioned, that type of list on the first page, usually there can be a, an application packet with a cover page that will show that criteria right up front. Um, people might have an application package that's two pages uh, describing to come and get more, uh, more forms, or they might get a 30 page application packet. Um, it, it depends on the, you know, the, the timing and um, the type of marketing that's being done. But that screening criteria is written and shared with applicants so that they do have transparency about uh, what the criteria is in general. But the key phrase in the HUD occupancy manual is about taking that screening criteria and consistently applying it to all applicants. The key phrase here, and as we continue to talk about a few more um, examples and um, regulations, is that it really is about a process that trained professionals in property management working in affordable housing constantly are going to compliance, screening, leasing, training to understand the processes to be adherent with fair housing law which is a number of best practices um, and, and it, it is a professional, um, there are certifications um, and there are um, experience levels that people at pro in property management of affordable housing will have to apply the criteria consistently. Next slide. So here is where I'm gonna describe mitigating circumstances because there really is no way for a property manager or owner to anticipate every possible situation or spell out those details for what types of exceptions any applicant might experience during the screening process. So the written screening uh, criteria and procedures are expected to be distinct enough as, as was uh, cited in the occupancy handbook, general criteria is what's written. So those criteria should be distinct enough and consistently applied to determine eligibility but also allow for a range of reasonable methods for documenting acceptance or denial. Here's another uh, citation from the uh, Mass Housing Tenant Selection Plan. This is a reference guide that Mass Housing published in 2018. And here again, the language is about um, um, carrying out the selection of tenants under the tenant selection plan, which we've discussed quite a bit in previous meetings but in a manner consistent with the guidance. The guidance here, meaning um, the HUD manual. So the agent must consider mitigating factors that rebut the presumption that an applicant shall be unable to meet the requirements of tenancy. There's some double negatives in there maybe, but um, hopefully you're following that if there is um, a, a, an item that might cause someone to be denied, mitigating factors are allowed into the process. So mitigating factors might include a showing of rehabilitation or rehabilitating efforts and must be balanced against potentially disqualifying behavior or circumstances. Now that can be a number of screening items, um, but the, what you're looking for is an improvement um, to offset a negative mark on someone's um, background check. That could be any aspect of a background check um, not just credit or rental history, that this would be allowed. But in considering both that um, something that would be a disqualifying factor, then you wanna balance that with a mitigating factor so that the agent, owner, manager should, can determine if there's a reasonable risk that the applicant would be unable to meet the essential requirements of tenancy. So just to 
take that more into layperson's terms, this is where there's a judgment call and there's a judgment call that is based on consistent practices, a general criteria that's set, and then that opportunity for someone to be given a second look of how can you offset maybe a, a, a mark on someone's record that you can say, this other information helps us to know that um, there's an improvement in that um, past behavior that should be given a second look. So in evaluating those mitigating factors to determine those exceptions, property management again utilizes uniform procedures with all applicants to prevent discrimination and avoid any fair housing violations. So this is just a, a method and a practice that's what's good for one is good for all. So you don't cherry pick some people get a pass because I think they look good or I got a really good feeling about their character. That's the type of thing that is not allowed in these practices because in the old days, um, and um, the, the source of discrimination was exactly that. People would just make that call, a judgment call, but it would not be um, always fairly administered. Next slide. So here would be a, a sample of the type of language that you would see in uh, HMRs. So this is pertaining to an existing SRO owned by Valley and managed by HMR. So this again would be the type of language that an applicant would see. They could see this as a part of their process. And this is just describing that in um, the area of credit, as an example, an agent can consider an applicant's credit history, but that can only be used in lieu of rental history to determine an applicant's ability to pay rent when rental history is not available. Now again, just to keep it simple, rental and credit history are two things that kind of go together. One can offset the other, because we're looking at a very particular behavior, which is how, how can we determine whether this applicant appears to be someone who is going to be a good renter and handle the obligations of a lease and rent payment. So the, that's the reason that the two are looked at together. Um, so when bad credit is the basis for rejection, you might have mitigating circumstances such as a representative payer or a reliable third party who would take written responsibility for payment, evidence that poor credit was a result of a disability that is now under control, or evidence that credit problems were the result of other circumstances that no longer exist. And there's a reason to believe that an applicant would now pay rent promptly and in full. This could lay out a number of very personal um, situations and the mitigating circumstances or the balance to these things might be, as I think the board was getting at, someone who's coming out of homelessness, does not have this history, someone who has maybe struggled in their past but is now working with a caseworker or with other support, personal or community support. And there's some evidence that you're seeing a balance of some past behaviors that are now um, improving or, or you have something like a representative payer, which sometimes uh, there are some rental programs, for instance, uh, RAFT or uh, um, community action types of programs, where someone will come in and say, we've been working with this person, we're going to help pay their rent for a certain period of time because we believe they have what it takes to stabilize with that kind of assistance. So those are the types of things that you might look at to help um, balance some, uh, some of those past um, behaviors. Uh, I think there's another slide. And again, um, and this is, I think maybe, I'm hoping building up to kind of the crux of what the board members' um, questions were about, which is that mitigating circumstances, again, are not just a verbal um, presentation by an applicant. These are to, to be verified. So those, that's where you know, an applicant might have a story to tell you, but then you're gonna to have to work with them to get some verification of what they're saying. So the individual person, again, agent, owner, property manager, who is verifying the information, they have to corroborate the reason given by the applicant for whatever that unacceptable item is on their record and then indicate a good prospect for lease compliance in the future because the reason for the unacceptable behavior is no longer in effect or isn't otherwise under control. So here again, the agent, um, and this is quoting from HMR's book, um, HMR screening criteria, 
The agent will have the right to request information reasonably needed to verify a mitigating circumstance, even if such information is of a confidential nature. So that means you could go to medical professionals um, or other service uh, providers who would provide confidential information to help understand um, what uh, this person has been doing in their life to uh, improve these circumstances. If the applicant refuses to provide or give access to that type of information, then the agent can choose to not consider the application. So this is the place where the applicant needs to cooperate with and understand the need to meet this criteria because we're looking for a consistent set of um, screening factors that will uh, hopefully prove that folks are gonna be successful in their lease as renters. And I don't know if there's one more slide. There is, okay. Yeah. Uh, so best practices are used during lease up and ongoing rentals. This will be the case at 132 Northampton Road in accordance with fair housing law and with the HUD guidance, the occupancy manual uh, I described earlier. And so just sort of in conclusion, again, just to repeat that the procedures used for verification of mitigating circumstances, just like all of the screening criteria are handled in a way that is consistently applied to all applicants. And the goal, the aim is to determine that an applicant, it will be able to perform to the obligations of the lease. There's one more excerpt here from the HUD occupancy handbook. And that's just to, again, just um, uh, reiterate the language around mitigating circumstances, extenuating circumstances. You will see both of those phrases used in um, compliance manuals. That, that we can consider those extenuating circumstances in evaluating the information, again, as a whole, obtained during the screening process to help assist in determining the acceptability of an applicant for tenancy. If the applicant is a person with disabilities, the owner must also consider extenuating circumstances where this would be required as a matter of reasonable accommodation. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with reasonable accommodation. I'm not gonna go down that path, but it is a process to make sure that anyone with a disability has a chance to ask for any accommodation that will help them through a process um, or to um, have a fair uh, access to any policy of the property. And then finally, um, any notice of rejection does include specific reasons for a denial, the right to request a reasonable accommodation and the opportunity to appeal. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions and then I'll, I'll open it up to the rest of the board members. So do these, this criteria that's still developed apply to all tenants, including the two that are the two units that are um, associated with the Department of Mental Health? I want to be careful there to just say um, there can be selection criteria that is attached to a program. One of the early slides described a programmatic um, aspect mm -hmm. of the aims. So there can be some exceptions that then must be fairly administered within that particular program if it, if it only applies to some units. Got it, okay. And secondly, HMR, as your agent will be the one that's, will be the entity that's uh, administering the selection process and not Valley, correct? That is correct. But you at Valley, you are, with HMR as your agent, you're responsible for and signing off on what those criteria would be. That is correct, as is the okay. agency, yes. Yep, right? So Valley is responsible for that. Um, So you were talking about the uh, credit history, rental history, the ability to look back to use rental history if credit history was bad and the ability to look at mitigating circumstances. So one thing I'm thinking of, and perhaps you can deal with the hypothetical, that would be a helpful way to describe the process and what you go through, because it sounds good, but I wanna deal with a, a sort of a hypothetical situation. You've got an individual who became homeless because they couldn't afford their housing. And they're applying for one of the uh, 10 units um, on that list. 
How do you deal with that? How do you look at, do you look back at their employment history with other histories that they have? Or, uh, well, just, I don't understand how you would deal with that issue. Sure. Where the reason that they, they, are, they are needing help is because they couldn't afford their, their rental and they got evicted. That's right, that's right. So I think the most obvious way that you can make a case for a person in that situation is if they're coming into a, a project-based subsidy or they're going to have a voucher, they've now changed from a circumstance where maybe they were paying $1,800 a month for rent, which they could not afford, and now they're going to be paying 30% of whatever their current income is. I've kind of fumbled with that in a previous um, uh, meeting of trying to describe that, but that would be an obvious way to say that you know, they maybe didn't have enough income to pay 1800 mm -hmm. but 30% of their income, that would work. That in itself would be a programmatic way of saying that's identify that is addressing the mitigating circumstance becomes the, the presence of a voucher sure. or a subsidy. Another way you could do it would be to say, let's say someone's coming and they are going to pay rent at an amount that, um, again, that sort of bar, if you're not on a subsidized, uh, either a project-based or a voucher-based subsidy, and you are looking at enough income to support the fact that you can pay your rent, you have to pass that bar in that case. So we would not rent a unit to someone who does not have the income to pay full rent on it. If it's $900, we need to be able to prove that the income is present um, or, um, or that some mm -hmm. other form of assistance like I said, the, um, I can't remember the term there, the uh, uh, representative, like a- A, yeah. a pay term. representative, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, those would be two examples of it. I think there, what you would be looking at is they would have an unfavorable rental history. Um, they might also have mm -hmm. an unfavorable credit history. Right. And so you might end up rejecting them for that reason. So I don't want, I don't want to have the, um, I don't want uh, it to come across as though every possible attempt is made to make every possible applicant, um, you know, find a mitigating circumstance. It's those applicants who actually have them, and then you can verify some sort of an offset or balance. Okay. On page six of the of the handout, um, it's a number. The, the title is. Referral and selection process continued. Um, you have a you reference a tenant selection plan. When is that finalized? What you've given us tonight are, are general, you know, six general principles. That's helpful. But when do you finalize the tenant selection plan that you'll be will be used by Valley or you used by HMR, your plan used by HMR to to actually select the tenants? So um, in my experience, what is typical is that, as in the case with Valley and this project, a draft tenant selection plan is proposed with the original application. So that is what the group has seen with the uh, PEL, that that draft is based on current practices, um, a similar property, uh, but until all of the programs are finalized and you mm -hmm. have the entire um, you know, deal configured, you can't finalize a tenant selection plan. I want to make the distinction that a tenant selection plan is the overall uh, description of the program and the property, whereas the tenant screening is the piece that's about background screening. So there is that difference. The screening is a part of a tenant selection plan. So this would be finalized at the time that all funding sources were in place well before lease up happened. Um, DHCD as the um, lender and overseeing institution on this would be the ones to make sure that it all fell in place with um, fair housing law and uh, good practices. So would, would that be that, done? Uh, Go just, just one note is that, yes, if, Laura. for example, if a community wants local preference, that becomes a kind of a key ingredient in a tenant selection plan. So we need to know all of those characteristics before we can get to the final version of it. Right. So I guess I need to go back to the PEL and look for something that has more detail than the six, six criteria that you listed in the PowerPoint tonight. I just haven't done that. I didn't realize it was there. There's something more, more detail in the, in the PEL, is that right? More detailed in what regard? Well, then the six, the six criteria that you had um, identified 
earlier in the presentation. Let's see, it would be on uh, sample, sample written criteria. Well, no, so it's eight, but there are eight written yeah. criteria. No, it's a good question. And I think it's a good point of clarity here to say that that type of written criteria is the general criteria that yeah. is referred to in the HUD occupancy manual, manual. So you won't necessarily see more detail than that. What you will have are the consistent practices to back it up. That those that type of a set of eight criteria plus practices that say, um, we, will, we will go through these pro procedures and gather information if we is needed to uh, verify an extenuating circumstance. That is what's done on a case by case basis. So I wanna make sure that no one's looking for anything that lays out, you know, this equals that, or this balances that, um, or particular types of exceptions. There's just too many to enumerate. Mm -hmm. And one last question, then I'll turn it up to everybody else. Um, so when will, when will the town see the finalized, the most detailed document that you are going to provide? Is it before um, buildings occupancy is granted? Is it before construction starts? Is it before lease up? And then, then it's almost too late for us to, to review it. So when, is, when, is, when, Laura, when will the town see that? Go ahead, Laura. So um, it's, it's commonplace that in the comp permit decision, there are checkpoints to return, like with final architectural plans, something like a final uh, lottery process, final tenant selection plan. So it's something that you can, you can write into your conditions. We usually end up having a final version when we're, it's called construction closing. So it's something that happens just before we break ground um, is the point when we've vetted that full plan through the Department of Housing and Community Development. It's one of the items on our closing checklist that has to be done. Okay. Great. Great. Um, open it up to other to questions from other members of the board. Mr. Maxfield. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so one of the things I'm thinking about here was, I'll, I'll just give, give kind of a brief example. I know um, a couple of years back, I'd been laid off from my job and I was collecting unemployment. And while I was doing that, I'd considered working while collecting unemployment, but I would have then been uneligible to make unemployment and would have essentially made less money by working. So it kind of created an incentive for me to, to not work. Um, I wonder if something like this, where if you, if you accept somebody in there, they're on some sort of voucher program um, and they're paying 30% of their income what would happen if they became ineligible for the voucher program? You've already signed a lease with them. They're already there. They're paying 30%. What happens if they are, are no longer eligible for a voucher program and say it comes time for renewal of the lease? Do they, do they lose their ability to continue living there, paying 30% of their income? W what happens to that person? It can happen, but let me give you the two scenarios. So first of all, to clarify that a project-based subsidy stays with the unit and does not leave a unit. So in that case, a resident would not lose their subsidy. They might not be performing to their lease. They might not be performing to paying their 30% of the income, in which case that could lead to uh, the action that would be an eviction because they're not paying their portion of the rent. If a person had their own voucher, it's rare, but it does happen uh, that if a, if a resident who has a, a mobile voucher does something wrong that can be damaging their unit. It can be a chronic housekeeping issue. It can be something that they've shown an inability to be successful at their responsibilities as a voucher holder, then um, a housing authority could take that voucher away. And when that happens, I have seen households that are then unable to pay rent. They typically then work with a caseworker or service provider to find the next best option. They might wanna to relocate to a property that has project-based, um, uh, but they may or may not be able to do that. I'm not gonna say that we wouldn't do everything we could to keep that person housed, but I'm not gonna say that I've not seen a person like that lose their housing. So can I add something? If your income fluctuates, so you have a project-based voucher because your income is below a certain level. If your income goes down, your share of rent goes down. Right. You go and you say, I have less money. I'm unemployed. I, now I only have unemployment. And they reduce your rent payment. If your income goes up to the point where you're over 30% AMI, you may gradually 
increase your per proportion of rent until you're basically paying the same rent as everybody else. But you're not going to be evicted from that unit because you are succeeding and making more money, but your subsidy component might be zero if your income, and we have had that happen with people. Absolutely. They get established, they start earning more, they work some overtime, and they're still in a voucher unit, but they've, you know, they don't have a subsidy um, component anymore. But if they then lose that job, they have the safety net of being able to go back again and say, my income changed again. And people's incomes these days, especially these days, but even before the pandemic, are, are very fluid. They really are, moving up and down for people who are kind of living on the margins. Mr. Maxfield, follow up? Yeah, just to follow up on that. So uh, maybe it's been explained and I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of missing it. The, the voucher program, so you, you let somebody in um, the, the one of those 10 units, uh, the 30%, this, who, who's paying you this voucher exactly? Where's this coming from? So we're proposing, there, there are two main voucher programs Section 8 is the federal one and MRVP is the state one. These are proposed to be state vouchers. So the State Department of Housing and Community Development is, they usually have a, a local vendor like Wayfinders. They're paying the landlord all of the, they compensate the landlord for any rent that you're missing because your tenant's only paying 30% of their income. So it's a cost share. Okay, and if what what would cause somebody to become ineligible? Do you do you have a, a case where somebody who might become ineligible for that voucher while still not making enough money to, to make up that difference? Is it that ever a case that that could come up? Yeah, but it probably wouldn't be a financial case. So the voucher really deals with someone's financial and economic situation. Mm -hmm. So if they were violating the lease in some other way they could still be evicted and therefore lose their voucher. Yeah, I, I can see many reasons. I, I only am talking about, I, I guess, eviction for non-payment. Non so they pay 30% uh, and then this voucher program makes up the rest of it. Right. And, if, if they don't pay their 30%, mm -hmm. yeah. if they have That's it, right. but they don't pay it, mm -hmm. they could be evicted. But uh, let's let's just say somebody's getting I I don't know six six hundred dollars a month. Let's 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 take that as the yep. they're going to give you two hundred in this right. program. We'll give you right. the rest of it. Is there yep. Any case where this person's their income wouldn't change. They're making six hundred a month every yep. month. That doesn't change. Could something happen that could cause them to lose their voucher that has nothing to do with uh, being an unruly tenant or violating yep. the, the terms of the lease? what happens if that person loses their voucher? Is that possible? How does that happen? And then what do you guys do if they no longer have this voucher? Right, it's, it doesn't typically happen. So I, can, I can't say never, never, because we all live in a world where state and federal funds are subject to appropriation. So typically the vouchers come in maybe five-year contracts and then they get renewed every five years. So if there were a cataclysmic failure at HUD or at the state level, and they said, we don't have money for these vouchers, we'd all, I mean, this question has come up before in this, from this board, it's, it would be an extreme situation that we haven't seen before, but it wouldn't be a fault of the tenants that they couldn't pay it. Um, we still have to serve, but by the deed restriction that we have, we still have to serve people who are 30% AMI. So it would be a very challenging time, I think, for landlords and tenants if our safety net of vouchers failed. And I would go uh, one step further even than that to say that the voucher program, project-based mobile, the MRVPs Laura is describing about, these are precious commodities that come out of the HUD budget that has been cut extremely over the years. They've become more and more precious. And so for that reason, the understanding that Bipartisan, anyone understands. You cut down voucher programs, you actually have social pandemonium. I mean, you have massive homelessness if there's not an ability for people to, to have that type of subsidy. So as Laura said, it's not happened before. Um, and you know, we live in these uncertain times, but uh, it's not one of the first things that anybody is gonna uh, send back in as any of the mo mobile or uh, or project-based um, subsidies. 
I guess right, last follow up on this and I'll, I'll, I'll yield to, to anybody else who has questions here on this. I just really want to understand this process because I, I, I think it very much could be a possibility that we see more federal funding of, of HUD getting cut. Um, you know, I worry, let, let's say the, the extreme, you know, kind of happens there. We, we do see deep cuts and we do see the federal government not, um, not being able to honor that, that, uh, that voucher. So now you have somebody in there under that 30% AMI, $600 a month, they're paying you 200, but now you're no longer getting the voucher from either the state or the federal government. What happens to that person? Would they then be evicted because the, the funding fell through? Is that, is that now on them? Nothing's changed for them financially. Um, can, will, will, they, will they no longer be supported? Um, Laura, you want me to go first? Sure. I think it's a very interesting question. I think what you have to understand is that there's a business model at that point. There's a business model for rental units that exist. So we're just going to say the hypothetical here is a, a project-based subsidy goes away. So a number of units in that project no longer get that subsidy. So now you have a business model that is saying, we would like to run this property well with the amount of rent it takes to run this property well. Um, all of those residents just lost their vouchers. This is a horrible shame and we need to displace them because in order to run this property well, we're going to need to collect more rent. And we would then work with, if it were Valley in place and that were a, a horrible situation we never wanna face, we would work with people to help find a different location for people to live if they were not able to pay their rent. Some of them might figure out how to pay their rent. Some of them might, uh, you know, may, they might do that above board, they might do that um, you know, in a way that they've got a friend staying over that we don't know about. A bunch of things could happen at that point that they would come up with their rent. So that could be the scenario. The other scenario would be the types of housing that existed in the past um, and that do still exist around shelters where you would have a very mission-based person try to figure out how to subsidize that property in another way to continue housing those same residents and somehow replace that subsidy. Um, in the past, those have been maybe faith-based organizations. They've been um, very, uh, 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 what do I want to say, uh, tenaciously dedicated um, uh, organizations who have wanted to house people at any cost, create shelter, but some of those conditions were not good conditions. So the models that we have for this business now are good quality housing with enough income to sustain good ho quality housing in perpetuity because of the government programs that support it. It's an interesting philosophical conversation, no doubt. Yeah, I think uh, I, I could get into the weeds on this for, for the, the rest of this meeting. So I'll, 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 I'll yield the floor for now, well, thank you. Maybe we'll chat one, one day a little more, Dylan, about it. <laughs> thank you. Are there other questions from board members regarding the selection process? I have one. Um, when, so when do you apply the selection criteria? Is it to get on the list or is it if you're already on the list then to select people from that list to be able to, to select them as potential renters? So is everybody on the list? Do you, do you go through the selection process to get on your list uh, for, the, for the housing or is it only is it done after the, the list is created and you start picking the names of the lucky winners, so to yeah. speak, the lottery, you pick the names of the lucky winners and then it's applied. I can answer that. It's a little bit of both. So um, when we do a lottery, we try to get enough basic information that we believe that people are eligible, but we do the harder look if they're coming to the top of the list. Uh, when okay. people apply to a property that has, you know, 100 people already on a wait list, they're going to do a really simple, what we call a pre-application, because it's just not humane to make people do a long application to get at the right. bottom of the waiting list. And by the time they come to the top, their circumstances have changed. So it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of both, of trying to okay. get just, just enough, but then do the really hard look when someone's actually going to be offered a unit. So the goal is to have a reasonable ex expectation if you're on the list, you meet the, you meet the basic criteria. And then yeah. at selection time, you dig down. Okay. You do, and, and time may have passed and your income may have changed. And again, people's income is pretty fluid. 
Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Ms. Lockwood. A real quick follow-up there would just be to say that that is the reason I wanted to include that the transparency piece of the selection criteria, we don't want people being disappointed. If there's a way mm -hmm. that they see selection criteria, uh, you know, some people will look at that. We hope they would still apply if they had a chance, but we would want them to know that. We wouldn't want to hide that from people and have them be surprised later. So applicants. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Maxfield, you had your hand raised. Uh, yes, um, I just have one more question here because you know even where I'm, I'm working on this and really going step by step with the process, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, and I guess I guess if you just give me you know kind of an example here where you know there's a, I'm not using anyone's names, but I I know of some homeless folks in town here who when I see them as this process is going on, I might say, hey, there's this affordable housing going on, you should apply. I'm, I'm talking to them, you know, out in the center. Where, where would I walk them to, to, to start the actual process of where do they file the paperwork? How do they get their name in the lottery? What, what would really just actually happen day to day, try to get someone in there? What would I do? To try to connect them with the property, like at the time of Lisa? Yeah, if, if I just said, hey, I, I'm aware of this, you should apply for it. Where would I take them? Where would I send them so, to talk to? What's just kind of a general example of what you, you think that I, process I will give you an example for Sergeant House because that has homeless units and it just leased up. So we did marketing for that and we, tr we sent information to all the shelters. Um, we saw places like Amherst Community Connections. My God, I think they filled out like 100 applications for people. So that I would say is if I saw someone on the street in Amherst, I would say, just go there. They have the, they'll print things, they'll copy things, they'll help you do it. Um, Craig Stores did the same thing. Elliott Homeless Services did the same thing. Sometimes people show up at our doorstep um, in Northampton and we help them fill out applications. So it's, there's numerous points of entry. Um, the applications would be on our website, but of course not everybody has computer, printer, um, but in, in specifically in downtown Amherst, you have two uh, locations where people can walk in and get help with an application like this. And we will make sure they have these applications available. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Mr. Maxfield, I would just also include in response to your question that uh, we do um, make sure that we anticipate reasonable um, accommodations. So as Laura was just talking about, those locations would have paper applications available so that people could see this criteria without having to go to a website. The other piece that I just wanna remind the entire board, the critical piece of the, um, uh, one uh, another critical piece of the tenant selection plan is the affirmative fair housing marketing plan where we are required to do outreach to reach as many people as we can to have a good diverse population aware of the opportunity. Thank you. Right. Are there any questions, other questions about the tenant selection plan? And there are not, we can go on to the two subjects that, that we were gonna to discuss today, but I don't wanna leave this with anybody still having a question that they didn't get the opportunity to ask. Okay, thank you very much for answering those questions. Um, the next item on the discussion is the density of the proposed project. And I understand that uh, Valley has, um, is going to speak directly to that. Yeah, I'm gonna pick it up from here. So much of this has already been presented to the board. Um, so it'll be a little bit of a rehash. Um, so one thing to, to realize about affordable housing is it's very often created at a higher density than surrounding uses. And this project is no exception. Um, because in this particular example, each unit is really small and intended for a single person, we did a comparison early on of the density of the proposed development with the density of bedrooms in other properties that were along Northampton Road. Um, and we saw a range of density of 1.21 bedrooms per acre to a high of 62.9 bedrooms per acre with a median of 10.56 bedrooms per acre. The proposed development is 32 bedrooms per acre. Um, there is a six unit rental condominium almost right across the street um, that has 14 bedrooms. And so because they're apartments and not just single tiny studio units, 
um, likely the occupancy in a typical um, multifamily apartment building might be 14 to 20 persons. So I just, we're really just putting this out because 28 units if they were three or four bedroom units would, would be a very different animal than 28 really small studio units. They, the, the comparable that we think is more relevant is, is the number of bedrooms. Uh, next slide. So we are primarily located in the RG zone. Uh, this particular parcel uh, or lot, it's composed of two parcels. Uh, has sufficient area to accommodate seven uh, townhouse or apartment style units. Uh, townhouses and apartments are allowed in RG with a special permit. Um, in RG, the minimum basic lot area is 12,000 square feet, and each additional unit in an apartment building requires an added 4,000 square feet. And both of these dimensional requirements can be modified through a special permit. So you can apply for a special permit to do an apartment building and you can ask for flexibility um, in these lot size um, requirements. Uh, the lot size of the property at this uh, location is uh, a little over 37,000 square feet. So just doing the math, um, the first uh, unit requires 12,000 and the, the, the balance would be 4,000 and that leads us to our seven townhouses or apartments without asking for any dimensional modifications as to the required area. So if we built seven units um, and they were three or four bedroom units, uh, the, the property would likely house at least 28 residents and have a similar density of occupancy as the proposed development. Uh, according to the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, up to four unrelated individuals can live in one dwelling unit and there's no, I don't think there's any limit on a group a family, a group of related persons. Uh, seven apartments would require two parking spaces per unit or 14 parking spaces in total. Um, and this is not to say that this is the same as a seven unit uh, building with multiple apartments. It's just kind of trying to provide some comparisons with things that are already kind of allowed within the zoning bylaw. Next slide. Um, so when we uh, first looked at acquiring this parcel before we purchased it, um, we looked at what was buildable on this property. Um, we acknowledge that the immediately surrounding properties have fewer units than the, the proposed development. Um, we hired an architect, the original architect, Kathy Ford, to do a, what's called a fit test uh, to determine how many units could be structured, constructed on the site. And I'm going to show you those slides in a second. Um, given the site's size and the absence of unbuildable areas, the availability of public water and sewer, um, the FIT test showed that as many as 50 or more small studio units could be constructed if the site were kind of built out to its maximum potential. Um, so sometimes you get a site that is larger, but it has wetlands or extreme slope or other things that mean that your buildable area is really quite a bit smaller than your total lot size. In our case, there really aren't any unbuildable areas on, on this particular person. Um, because the size of a 50 plus unit building uh, felt out of proportion, not so much the units, but the actual physical size, um, we selected a smaller build out of 28 units with an overall building square footage and number of bedrooms closer to the neighboring properties. Still higher, but closer. And um, again, as we've talked about, what's the gross square footage of this building? compared to our immediate neighbors, we're kind of in the middle of a larger building, the, the field house, and then a little bit smaller building, the Victorian that's next to us. Uh, next slide. Um, so these, again, these we've showed before, but these were early, the early, very first fit tests that we did. This was a reuse of the original house with some uh, units added, and a, a two-story and a three-story option were considered. Next slide. Uh, this again was a reuse of the original house with more units on it and it's actually too small for me to read but I think the largest number of units here is I don't know 45 or 50 units um, for a three-story building which is allowed under the zoning bylaw. And then the third one was you know if we really kind of started to maximize and build you know up into this front lawn area this, at only a two-story building, we could get a significant number of units um, on the property. And again, these are just point of comparison, kind of general discussion of density items. 
Uh, next slide. So one thing we're thinking a lot about these days is um, making eco-friendly housing. Um, so small housing units built at high density are more eco-friendly. Um, so small units in a highly energy efficient, compact, dense configuration are desirable from the perspective of energy use per person. Uh, the dense units conserve land area and allow for more open green space. Uh, nationally, planning policy is shifting to favor denser multifamily development. And there are even some cities and towns no longer allowing detached single family home construction because this type of housing is associated with the highest level of energy use per person. So the proposed development represents a highly energy efficient way to provide safe, affordable, adequate housing for 28 single person households. Next slide. Uh, high housing density in an area of high property costs. Um, so we find that there's an inverse relationship between the cost of property and housing density. So the more expensive a housing market is, the greater the financial pressure is for, for higher density. Um, Amherst, uh, um, we could provide data, but I, I think you know it as well from your own experience um, as being one of the most expensive property markets in the Pioneer Valley, which creates some market pressure toward higher density. Um, and this is um, exponentially increased, I would say, for affordable housing, uh, which has limited resources for property acquisition. So we typically look to spend between zero and $15,000 per unit for acquisition costs. Uh, and we've often developed properties provided by municipalities for a dollar or for zero. So um, for example, Valley built 11 units at, uh, it's called Valley Main Street, that was a donation from the Amherst Housing Authority, as an example. So we didn't pay anything for the cost of the property. Um, the current property at 132 North Hampton Road has a fixed acquisition cost of $14,553 per unit if we build 28 units. Uh, greatly reducing this density would drive uh, the acquisition costs beyond reach for an affordable housing use. Next slide. I think that's it on density. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause here and see if people have questions or comments. I think what the, the key factor here is that um, regardless of the zoning bylaw, and the ability, and what, how it restricts the number of units and the number of people that can be in this property. Comprehensive permit process allows us to waive those things and our, those restrictions. And the real question for this, this body, it seems to me, and I'm speaking mostly to my fellow members, the real question for our board is whether this development with this number of units, this, this density is appropriate in the area meets the, the the master plan meets the needs of the community and is appropriately appropriately situated there i think that's the real issue it isn't so in my opinion it's not so much about whether the zoning law permits this or would allow it under a special permit those aren't the issues when we're when we're dealing with a comprehensive permit we have the ability to waive those restrictions if we believe that this project meets the needs of the community and is consistent with our, our master plan and consistent with um, the, the, the area. And that's, our that's the judgment we have to make. Are there any questions about density? All right. Um, I don't want to cut that off. That was, that's a, it has been an issue, but uh, it looks like there's not a question on it. So we'll move on to, um, to amenities, architecture, and site layout. Sure, this is- You're gonna present on this as well. Well, I'll be partly. Um, this is kind of a broad category. We weren't exactly sure what was, what was of interest. Um, we feel like we've had a lot of discussion about the site plan and the site amenities. So I just wanted to just share the current site plan and, and run quickly through it. Um, so the one, if I can, just for a second, I mean, some of the, some of the questions we've, we've pushed back some questions from board members on these issues. And so that's the, uh, okay. the appropriate time. And that's okay. the reason we're, we wanted you to speak now. It's things like the bike rack, what the, the outdoors are going to, what the outdoors are going to look like. People may have some more questions about landscaping. I don't, I think we've gone through that, but they may. So it's the time for our members okay. to ask questions generally about the, uh, the architecture, the, 
the design, okay. the layout, okay? Okay. So we thought we'd start with the site plan. Um, the one change that we definitely would like to make from the original site plan that came in is down here. Um, simply reorienting the bike rack, it would be the same size and appearance as the this drawings that you've seen before. Um, this came out of our discussion about snow storage and just allowing us to maximize this little kind of trapezoid here for snow storage by shifting this location. Um, as we look more closely at the smoking area um, choices, that could also impact uh, the layout of the site in hopefully some pretty minor ways. Um, we have essentially a, a double wide, a two way driveway coming in. Um, as we've talked about, we have 16 parking spaces. Uh, this is the area for vans uh, to drop off and pick up. Uh, we have a uh, dumpster area here that's fully surrounded by a cedar fence with gates that would open. We have a turnaround for a packing truck to come in and smaller emergency vehicles to be able to turn around. Uh, we have a small shed here for miscellaneous um, yard equipment and uh, gardening supplies. Um, on the exterior of the building, we've, we've noted locations where we think condensers will be located for the heating equipment. Um, we do have this outdoor patio space that's connected to the common room on the ground level. Um, we're showing some tables and chairs. Um, we're showing a couple of movable um, kind of gardening, large gardening uh, pots. Uh, when you come over here, we show another suggested area for gardening as well as there's one back here. Um, we've talked about the fact that we expect all of the walkways to be fully um, handicapped accessible. Uh, we won't need any ramps to get into the building. Uh, this main walkway will be uh, concrete and these uh, uh, smaller walkways will be kind of a recycled rubber uh, type of material. Uh, we did had a recommendation that came from the um, accessibility committee to actually not use brick on this patio, but to use something more like a poured concrete um, that wouldn't heave over time or have little grooves in it that someone's cane might get stuck in. So I think that we want to follow that advice um, and do some kind of a maybe a concrete with a stamped pattern and a color. Um, we have talked quite a bit about landscaping. Happy to go back and talk some more about that if people would like. What we have proposed, and I know that the board you know, went back and forth a little bit on its opinions about this, is the removal of the row of, of evergreens that are currently here, um, plantings on either side of a new uh, eight foot high cedar fence that would travel from back here all the way around to here. Um, and I suspect if we end up with a smoking area here, we might want to do a little corner fence or something here, but I don't know yet. We would return to you with ideas about that. Anything else you wanted to add, Rachel? You're muted. No, that was a great, Laura, thank you. Ms. Loeffler, we just um, give your name and, and for the record, please, and, ad and address. Um, I'm Rachel Loeffler, uh, principal at Berkshire Design Group um, at Fort Allen Place, Northampton. Thank you. It's, it's odd that your, um, your introduction of yourself is longer than your comment, but we need to do it for the record. Okay. <laughs> She can talk more if you want. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. We're good. She had, it was a really good statement right there. Okay. <laughs> Both your identification and your substantive statements. Thank you. All right. So let's move on, Ms. Baker. Uh, architectural plans. Um, oh, forgot I put these in. So yeah. um, wanted to give you something new to look at because we've looked a lot at the building um, and these are actually the photos that we took before the building was designed. So uh, these are inspiration photos they're called. So these are houses. This one happens to be right across the street. Houses in Amherst. Do the next one. Another house in, nearby in Amherst and a third house nearby in Amherst. And you can see 
the scale of this um, house is, you know, you're looking at the two full stories, we're looking at these kind of steep roofs that are broken up with gables, we're looking at some porch elements. Uh, next slide. And then um, I took these photos early on because it to me was a great example of a building that's fairly massive. I mean, this is a large structure, uh, probably has, you know, maybe has 30 dorm rooms in it uh, on the Smith College campus, but it has this nice residential feeling to it. And that was important to us. Uh, next slide. Same with this one. I was looking at how the massing, you know, we, we picked up this idea in our plan of having, you know, the first ground floor level be a different type of um, material, exterior material to kind of break up the massing again of a fairly large structure, again, using bump outs and different kinds of roof lines to do that. Next slide. So again, something new to look at. Um, when we were going to reuse the original little house that's there, the Cape, um, this was the set of plans that were uh, originally developed. And you can see many of those themes from the photographs showing here. You know, lots of kind of different roof angles, very traditional pitch to the roofs. Again, a different type, type of exterior material here on the, on the bottom level. Next slide. Then the architect decided to retire and we brought a new architect in. And that architect strongly recommended demolition of the existing house, which I think was a very smart decision, although sometimes a little sad to take things down. Um, it improves the handicapped accessibility. It is probably more cost effective to build. So this was their first iteration of um, what they thought could be an efficient uh, building of the same, it's actually the same floor plan as the building that we ended up with. Um, mm -hmm. Next slide. These are more looks at that. It's a very modern contemporary building. I know there's a number of these that are actually in Amherst being built now. Next slide. And the next one. Um, we decided, the owners group decided that we really wanted we, we didn't want a uber modern looking building at this location. And people may have different opinions about that. Um, we wanted something that was much more similar to the buildings that were around it and gave kind of that traditional New England flavor. So next slide. So then we kind of morphed into this, which started to pick up again some of these nice gables that you see in the, the, the inspiration photos. You know, the windows are a more traditional style, um, but, it's, but it's kind of plain and boxy still. Next slide. Keep going. And so then you, oh, back, back. <laughs> so then you come to um, what was the set that was proposed for the zoning board to consider, where, you know, you can see that we're picking up some more details. Um, at, we actually have some more detailed um, elevations to go through with you. This is just kind of the, these are the renderings to see how it sits on the land. Uh, next slide. And I'm gonna let Tom talk through some of the features of the building design as it was presented with the zoning application. Um, thanks, Laura. Uh, thanks, Ms. I'm Tom Chalmers from Austin Design. I live in Gill, Massachusetts. Um, so the, the, those, um, the first uh, renderings that we did with the, the modern did not go over very well, as, as Laura mentioned, but it puts, they're useful to put in perspective um, what, you know, what we're proposing, which is radically different than that, but much more consistent with what is, what's in the neighborhood and in the, in the general area. Um, so the, the features that really carry on that on the building are the overall massing, which is trying to um, break up while it's a large building, uh, we make an effort to break it up into, into smaller pieces that are articulated through the roof. So the, the, the various bays that um, carry up the, the end bay facing, the front bay facing the street, and then the series of bays along the sides are all about the same proportion. And as those rise, they carry up into uh, gable dormers coming off the main gable roof. Um, the roof pitch is a 10-12, which is pretty consistent with most of the, of the similar kinds of buildings in the area. Um, 
we've, again, the windows are very similar, two over one windows. Um, when we, uh, a couple of the earlier renderings, the first earlier rendering that had the gable roof design that was kind of presented plainly, what's really missing there and what's in the new one, which brings out a kind of richness and depth of character is uh, thicker, uh, wider trim bands, both on corner boards, freeze along the roof, water table at the base, uh, window trim, kind of fattening that up to give us sort of like a little bit of flour added into the soup. Um, collaborate siding, which is very, very traditional. And then the stone band that, that goes uh, around the base. Um, we had a comment earlier, uh, probably one of the initial meetings about the rendering um, and the proportion of the stone base to the rest of the building. Um, do, can we move on to another slide? I'm not sure if you have. Um, yeah. Do you have the do you have the exterior elevations on this as addition yeah. to the renderings? No, I just have these guys. No. Yeah. Okay. So we we also so these are renderings from a model that we did. Um, we did work up uh, flat on exterior elevations based on the um, drawing file and the the position of the stone band to the siding we we modified. Um, it's quite different in that. I can, if you'd like to take, if that's a, something you'd like to look at in detail, I can, if I could share the screen, I could bring those drawings up. Yeah, can you, I would like to see that. Can yeah, you bring okay. those? The... So um, let me get into here, find the right piece. Okay, can you see that plan on my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So these are the floor plans, but let me scroll down here. Well, so here's the, the roof plan. This is what I was talking about by having the bays um, carry up to the top. It results in, a, in breaking up the volume. But this is, um, I think these drawings are together. Yeah, so this is, this is, the, this is from the SketchUp model that we had. Um, and this, this area in here, the sort of proportion between the base and the windows was, was the question. Um, we have, uh, this was developed sort of more in the line drawing of the CAD program. And we, we, we brought that base, stone base up, more reflective of the change in, in floor level. So pretty much this band is along the first floor. Um, and that reduces this, this massive area in here that was shown on that other model is not there anymore. So I think this, this, this to me, this looks quite a bit better. This band works out well with the porch roof. This is the street side facade. Um, again, these are front on elevation so that you don't, you know, these built, these sections on the back are, are very far away. Um, but that's the, I can, so if we scroll back and forth, that's how this one was. And then we worked on it and in the other drawing came up with this. We have not yet gotten back to revising the other model to reflect this change in band drawing. In band. So, so this was a suggestion that came from the planning board. The planning board invited us to come in and do a presentation to them. And then they wrote a letter of support to the zoning board of appeals that had a few comments in it. And one of them was, you know, kind of correcting this, you know, this issue of proportion. We thought it was a good comment. So we will be integrating that into the plans as we move forward. Yeah. I mean, really, where, where we are now, I think, you know, the design at this phase is really, a, it's, a, it's a process and um, a lot of drawings, the drawings are not fully finished, so they're not fully consistent. So there are things on, on um, for instance, on this drawing, we have some, we've worked out a little bit more on how we would like to see this heavy band work here. Um, but on the other one, we have more, uh, that's missing that character that we haven't put that on there, but this is sort of the overall massing is more the way we'd like it in, in, in this drawing. Um, and I think that's most of what we wanted to say yeah, about, yeah. you know, how we got to this particular, the building that looks like it does. 
So I have a couple of questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah. I have a couple of quick questions. Number one, when I know under the comprehensive permit process, we don't need to see build ready drawings at this stage, but I'm assuming that, that those have to be provided before you get a building permit, they have to be provided to the town, correct? It's up to you to decide. What I've seen most often is that yes, okay. the building permit becomes the trigger that you can't get a building permit without, without back to the zoning permit. board, they review the yeah. final plans and bless them. Yes. Okay, so I wanna make sure that that's your understanding as well as mine. Yeah, that's been uh, my experience. Secondly, at that time, we'll know more about materials, but on the exterior of the house, um, are you looking at clapboards? Are you looking at wood? What, what kind of material are you looking, and what is the, the stone below? Is it brick? Yeah. Is it, is yeah. it, you know, what is, I, I know these aren't final, but what's right. your thought process on that? So our thought process, um, it, we, we almost never use wooden clapboards. Um, we tend to use, they're called hardy panel, they're a cementitious yep. board. Concrete. Yep, they yeah. look, um, you can paint them, you can get them in colors yep. that are pre-painted, but they're incredibly durable. Um, so we would likely, but they do look exactly pretty yeah. much like, so you can get them with a texture, without a texture. Um, and then where we have some trim elements, like we might use some shakes somewhere, um, again, they would also be of that same material. Um, for the trim trim work itself, we tend to use either um, cementitious trim or uh, kind of a solid. Well, how would it's you a composite? A, 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 is that yeah, composite material? Okay. Um, and then the band at the bottom, you know, <laughs> I, I really was trying to pick up. We're trying to pick up the. Um, the stonework next door at the field house, which has this nice um, gray kind of granite looking stone. So it wouldn't be real granite probably, I mean, it would be stone, but um, it would probably just be a facade of stone that would be applied. But that was kind of, the, that was the inspiration for how it would look. But the notion is to try to reflect something in the neighborhood. Yeah. With, with try to, okay. Yeah, I can I can say it would not be brick. I, I think there's we're not thinking of, any, of of using brick in that at that height, but stone is more contextual. And it's a it is as Laura said, it's a veneer. It, it would be applied over over the wood framing. Okay, but it's it's actual stone, and it looks like stone, yeah. and I'm sure it's what they used at the field house as well, something similar. Great. Um, questions from board members regarding. The architecture, site plans, amenities. We, we've talked about, um, this is a good place. If we, we've talked about closet size. We've talked about a lot of other things, but this is a, the best opportunity we're gonna have to go into those details at this time. So Mr. Maxfield, let's see your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so first would be, I know there's some discussion about the, um, the trees and the lighting uh, there, we, we had landed on, we were thinking, well, was it eight foot or 10 foot lights for the they, parking lot? They were originally uh, 12 foot and then we scaled them down to 10 foot. Yeah, and then as far as removal of the trees, I remember the, the abutter there had said they had asked for a 12 foot fence. You guys applied for an eight foot fence. Was there a reason you, you folks applied for an eight foot rather than a 12 foot? Yeah, we, I, I don't see many 12 foot fences in residential settings and we didn't think it was really appropriate for the neighborhood. We thought eight feet would, is much more common in residential areas. 12 feet to me begins to look like some kind of, you know, highway fence or just something that was more commercial and institutional. And I, I, Can I add one, one thing there? It, by the time you go up to 12 feet or even 10 feet, the, the structure of the fence, in order not to end up, you know, falling over and stuff, has to be very substantial. And it does end up appearing much more like a, a real barrier, a sound barrier or something else like that than an actual, you know, residential fence. Yeah, I just raised the question because I know I, uh, I am very sympathetic to the uh, point of not wanting lights shining into your windows at night. Um, but I guess, because I know if we really can't lower those lightings below 10 feet to then have an eight foot fence, um, 
Yeah, the, the, because they're all, they're all full cutoff lights and they only shine down, um, and the neighbor is sitting up on a hill, um, mm -hmm. I really don't think they're going to have lights shining in them, especially when Amherst College has their lights on. <laughs> it shouldn't be a problem at all. <laughs> but we really, it, it, we, we have um, the advantage of that height differential because their mm -hmm. house is sitting quite a bit higher. Okay. Yeah, that, that was my question. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. O'Meara. Thanks for your presentation. Um, question about your bidding process in terms of, I know you have many buildings successfully done in Northampton area as well as other places. Do you typically try to use local contractors? Is that a consideration? It is a consideration. Um, and honestly, our jobs don't tend to be so large as to attract general contractors from far flung areas. But um, it is, w Valley's a private nonprofit, so we can do, uh, we, we typically do a request for proposal style of bid for, for a contractor. Um, and we usually will send that out to people that we know are have the scale and the experience to do it. If someone contacts us and wants to be included, we will look at their bonding capacity and have they done residential construction and things like that. So it's not an exclusive list, but we, we tend to be hiring from the Western Mass area. Thank you. Yep. Other questions regarding the architecture of the site, the amenities of the of the building. Okay. Um, the next order, I think we've completed the, what we were just going to discuss on the agenda item. There's one other thing I'll just mention uh, for the benefit of my fellow board members. There has been some discussion about um, local preference we're going to ask, we're asking the applicant to provide a written submission to the office, to the town on local preference. And we're going to ask our, our uh, of council, Mr. Witten, to review that and, and um, submit something to us as well. And so we can have a discussion on that when we have the um, legal, we have some legal documents, uh, as opposed to us trying to weigh into this, uh, which turns out to be a fairly um, arcane and complicated uh, subject. But for a later point in time, when that uh, consideration comes up under conditions, we will have um, some uh, considered legal documents to look at and positions to review and, and for us to, for our judgment. But we're not gonna go into that tonight because it's, uh, we, we don't have enough information at present to make decisions or even a good presentation. Um, the next order of business is public comment. And so Maureen, would you open that up and so that people uh, can have the opportunity to comment on uh, um, on what the project, what they've heard tonight, on in general, in general, what they care about in the project. What sure. I'd ask you to do is to um, indicate that you're that you wish to speak by raising using the raise hand function of Zoom. I think most people by now <laughs> know how to do that. I'd encourage you to do that. And if you uh, do wish to speak, please identify yourself. Uh, your name and address for the record, and try to keep, or it's only 8.30, try to keep your comments to four or five minutes, something like that. I, if you go long, I will try to um, to remind you, I don't have a buzzer and I don't have a green light, but we're gonna try to keep the comments uh, fairly short, or within four to five minutes, so that um, everybody who wants to speak has an opportunity. So if there are people that wish to comment, this is the time to do that. I'm going to give everybody just an, a minute to figure out the raise hand function. If they haven't done it already, <laughs> it may be why we're not seeing any. But if in a short while we don't see any public comments, we will move to the next item on the agenda. Uh, I see someone's hand. Yes, I do see uh, one. Yes. Erica, can you uh, can can you speak, Erica? I, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Erica Piedad and I live at 480. Oh, 
Sorry, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Sorry, hold on. Sorry. Okay, say that again. Sorry. Can you start oh, she's over? Still muted. She, there she goes. Erica, can you start over again? Sorry, yeah. I, I, I pressed the wrong button. Sorry, Erica. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Erica Piedad. I live at 488 Montague Road, so uh, north of where the project is. I'm also a member of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, so I want to be transparent uh, that I'm a, uh, a volunteer there, and I volunteer there purposely because I wanted to ensure that our community has the ability to provide affordable housing and that we address uh, what I would consider uh, to some extent uh, huge privilege to live in this town, but very, very difficult to live in this town. I've rented in this town as well as I've, uh, I now own a house in this town. Um, I know that there are some members that feel that this project may not be appropriate for their neighborhood. Um, I wish I lived in the neighborhood there so I could purposely say that I would love to have it in the neighborhood. What I've heard um, a couple of times in terms of presentations here, as well as at the Affordable Trust, uh, is a very, very comprehensive, uh, thoughtful, well thought out plan to provide affordable, effective, supportive, a uh, beautiful environment, uh, architecturally sound, fitting right into the community um, project. And I'm actually very, very proud to be part of a community that wants to address affordable housing which has huge implications on homelessness. And I'm glad Mr. Maxfield talked about the homeless people that he has spoken to in downtown Amherst. I've also spoken to people, as well as people who are teachers and people who work in this town who can't afford to live in this town and would love to live in this town and would love to raise families in this town. Um, there are individuals as well as families who really, really want to be part of this community. So I want to commend this um, board for asking very, very um, in-depth questions that have solicited wonderful responses, very um, thoughtful responses. Um, this is a project that has accountability. Um, I actually work for the state, so I'll be very transparent as, uh, as part of that. I do work for the state. Um, and to, um, I think it's really critical to understand that um, this nonprofit organization has excellent um, experience um, and as well as has to be accountable both to a federal criteria as well as state criteria. And so in just hearing all of this, I, I do hope that all of you will support this project. I think this is a wonderful project um, in terms of addressing what I've considered classist structural classism, um, where people can't afford um, to actually have an opportunity to live in this community. Um, and so this is really a, uh, an opportunity for us to do something right uh, in addressing homelessness as well as affordable housing here. Um, the one last thing that I wanna say is that I work in public health and uh, addressing affordable housing is addressing homelessness. And I think it's really critical. It's a human right to have housing um, and we don't have enough affordable housing. We have a, a affordable housing plan, but very few options. Um, so I, I do hope that you do uh, support this plan. I think it's very well thought out. Um, and I think there's a lot of accountability. Uh, and I think it's perfect for the community and it fits in the plan in terms of increasing affordable housing. So thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to make a comment? Well, I think that's, we have no other um, requests to make a comment. We can move up to our next item on the agenda. Uh, what, the next item on the agenda is compiling a list of um, questions, requests, possible conditions, something we've been doing the last couple of meetings we wanna add to that. Um, the thing to do tonight would be to take what, we've, what we discussed tonight and if you have ideas for, for, for um, um, questions for the applicant or for additional conditions that we should consider, this would be the time to bring them up. To give you an idea of the, of the process that we're gonna go through, the next meeting on this subject is two weeks. 
And we, right, Maureen, it's in two weeks. Yep. So it'll be, I, we think it's, we'll talk about that in a second, but um, it'll be two weeks out. And between now and then, we hope to put together a list of, of conditions, potential conditions, and we already have the request of waivers. And my, my intention would be at the next meeting that we go through waivers and conditions to the extent possible. It'll probably take more than one meeting because those conditions tend to be long and numerous for a comprehensive permit. But we begin the process of going through conditions and waivers over the next couple of meetings. And to do that, we need to get your input. So if you have ideas for that, this is a great place to, um, to put them. You can also individually send an additional uh, um, idea about a condition or a comment or a concern. You can share that with the staff, not with each other, but with the staff um, if you have additional ideas because uh, you don't want to violate the open meeting law. But you can set, you always can talk to the staff. So um, I know that there are, so next, in the next week you will get, before the meeting, you will get a, co a copy of the uh, a draft project application report for lack of a better term, which will have some conditions and will have um, uh, potential conditions that the ones we've used in, over time and the ones that are unique to this site. So for tonight, I noticed one, I had a couple of conditions that I thought we should be thinking about. The first is um, the tenant selection criteria. Um, that is something that I'd want to, I'd want to make sure that, that, that a copy of that final tenant selection criteria is submitted to the town and that if any sub significant or substantial change is, and that it's submitted to the town and that we see it before at, at some point in a public meeting. And that in the future, if there's any significant change or substantial change to that tenant selection process, that the town is notified. And if, and if in the, the building department's judgment, it is significant that we review it in a public meeting. So that's one condition that we should, that I'd like to have considered in the next, in, in terms of the, um, the next meeting. Um, are there other conditions or that people would like to discuss, would like to suggest at this point in time? Um, and as, as I said, if you don't have to have them all now, if you have other conditions, if you want to, you want to suggest you can bring them directly to Maureen. Mr. Maxfield. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, going back to, I think what I was talking about earlier about with the, um, the way that the, the, the funding comes through from the state and the federal government. I, I know we've been talking about it like it's it, it's something so far fetched that that funding could could dry up, but I I think it might be a good idea for us as a board to consider that to some degree as a possibility, um, as as the way things are and have been going in in, in the nation speaking federally. I, I think we can should definitely give that some thought of of what could happen should that funding run out, and I'm not terribly comfortable with the idea that we are putting up, um, both the state and the town are putting money into a project that could ultimately end up being, that there could ever be a situation where we could say, well, well, too bad, so sad for, for these people who, who get in there, they play by the rules as well, um, the, the tenants, and then there could ever be this, this situation where they could be evicted. And I understand that this is a private entity that, that also may, might be a nonprofit, but does need to, uh, does have to worry about their income. Just again, not to get terribly philosophical on it. It's, it's a little, I think it is a little strange that we live in a world where uh, we use uh, public funding to give to a private entity to then provide a public good, but that is the world that we live in. Um, so I, I think we might need to give some consideration for kind of that extreme possibility of, of what would happen if funds run out uh, something from HUD. If it's, if it's a remote possibility, great, then I, I, I hope that any condition related to that never comes up. But if something like that were to ever happen, uh, it, 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 it wouldn't sit well with me knowing that I had approved this project and then say, 10, 15 years down the line, something happens with funding and then people are being evicted because that, that funding had run out. I don't know necessarily a, a responsible way at this point we could put on some type of condition, but I, I think it's something that the board might want to consider for that possibility that uh, no one would be evicted by essentially playing by the rules 
that that were laid out at the time that they they signed the lease they came in um I, I'd like to see if there's any way we can work in some type of protection where we don't have to worry about that in the future because I don't think it would sit well with me knowing that I had approved this project, missed that opportunity, and then the worst case scenario happens and then people are being evicted who we approved this project specifically to house. Yeah, I, I guess, Mr. Maxfield, are you looking for some kind of a um, uh, sort of a lack of a better term, uh, what happens if if we, we have that, uh, the um, one in a million chance or one in a, a thousand chance that there's no funding available, no dedicated subsidies available, and what would be their response? And you want them to, do you want them to describe that? We can't prevent it with a condition, right? We can't prevent the re removal of money with a condition, but we could, you're asking them to describe what they would do in that situation. I don't know how we can I don't know how we can affect what the federal government's going to do or the state government can do in an economic downturn or if, with a, a, governor, a governor or a president or a Congress that isn't going to support this stuff farther on. But we could ask them to, to plan something, I guess. Is that what you're looking for? Or are you looking for some way to, because I don't know what, the, yeah, I, I, think, the thing, I think you need to, to think that through a little bit before, in preparation for next week when we can talk about it again. But I think you got to think through it a little bit, how you're going to, how you're going to have a condition that is going to reflect or that will um, impose upon them responsibility to keep that, keep these, this housing available and open when neither them nor us can affect what happens with the federal government or the state government funding. Yeah, it might, it might be just, just out of our purview as, you know, local town zoning board of appeals and yeah. that, that just might be the case. But uh, I, I'm certainly going to give it um, yep. a thought between now and next meeting if there's, there's really kind of any way that that can be implemented responsibly. And, you know, if that's, that's something any of the other board members uh, uh, consider important as well, I'd, I'd certainly appreciate them, at, at the rest of the board as well, kind of giving thought to this issue. And, and, you know, maybe someone can come up with a better idea than I could about this if, if you also value it as an important issue. Mr. Yep. Chair, uh, Ms. Yep. Brestup. Ms. Brestup, I saw that. Ms. Brestrup had a question, or had, you had your hand raised. I think she's... Um, I just wanted to say that I believe that, pardon? I believe that federal and state money come into play during construction and development of... We're, we're getting a uh, late... The project we're getting some latency and running, there. Um, to support the project. Uh, Chris, could you repeat that? Um, um, your your internet is choppy. Yeah. Uh, um, so if I hold my computer up in the air, then it's not so choppy. It, no, <laughs> that's what I'm it doing. It's still bad. Um, I'll go in another room. Okay. What or if I go in another room? Yeah, sure. And if it's still choppy, you could uh, submit an email to the board. All right. So I'll try once more. Oh, that's yeah, much yeah. better. It's already working. All right. So I believe that the federal and state money comes into play during the development part of this project and um, helps with the construction. But once the project is up and running, they rely on the income that they receive from the rentals. And um, that's what they've shown in their pro forma. So maybe you want to go back and look at the pro forma and see how they propose to support this project in the future after it's up and running. And that might help to answer some of your questions and concerns. Uh, Laura is raising her hand. Ms. So Ms. Baker. That, that, the main subsidy for this project comes at the front end in, in capital right. grants. Um, it, and it's true for the majority of the units that that's true, that the rents are set low because of that infusion of capital at the beginning. However, there are 12 units proposed that are, are intended to be linked to the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program. And I think it's those particular tenants that um, Mr. Maxfield's talking about is that if that rental voucher program went away, 10 years from now, two years from now, what happens to those individuals? And it's a scary question. I mean, it would, it would play out 
not just in this project, but throughout our landscape and throughout the public housing authorities, which also rely upon subsidies. So it, it would be a pretty big deal. Um, and I, you know, I think we should all think about it because I'm not sure what the solution is. You know, I think I, I, we don't want to evict people. That's not what we're in the business of doing. Um, but we need to kind of balance the books at the same time. So how do we achieve that in this kind of worst case scenario situation? And, and I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Mr. Maxfield. I guess we'll, I'll just ask it at this point, um, just, just throwing out just kind of an idea here of the idea of maybe setting up some sort of, you know, rainy day fund that some type yeah. of trust that would be when this project goes in and you start collecting rent that yes. would have to go into a trust specifically to cover right. the worst case scenario should uh, uh, right. money run up, there be some, some delay that there could be from that trust, something like that. Is, is that yeah. something that, that board members and, and the, the project developers here, is that something that at this point sounds reasonable or is, is there some reason well, you, that? They, they do have a capitalized reserve that yeah. they begin at the beginning and they, they've modeled out with um, a, a smaller increase in rent and a higher increase in operating cost how that capitalized reserve would be drawn down. And that's a very, I would say it's, it looks to me like it's a very conservative estimate that, um, but it shows that you, in that you, I think you've anticipated that out eight or 12 years, you're gonna to have to be dropping, uh, going into your capitalized reserves. And I don't know if that's, uh, that seems to me that that's um, realistic. And so they, they've done some of it already. Maybe you should, yeah. maybe you want to, I think I would look at that Mr. Maxfield in the pro forma and see if that might solve some of your problem. I think they're looking at a works case scenario for the capitalized reserves, but Ms. Baker, please. please there is, uh, there is a capitalized that. operating reserve that is to cushion downturns, um, but not necessarily catastrophic ones. And right. the state does limit how much we can sock away at the front end. They actually have standards and caps that they put on those things. So we can't just take a million dollars of public money and say, we'll just save it just in case. Yeah. Um, you know, as we've seen in this, this COVID period, the government has implemented some unusual things to provide an added safety net for people. Now, that may not be adequate, um, but in, in extreme times, we don't know exactly what all the resources will be. Um, the state will certainly try to protect the very lowest income tenants, as will Valley. Um, we all are kind of in the boat together with, with trying to preserve those tenancies. And maybe the town would too. I mean, the town has resources as well. So it's like, where would you look in this hypothetical to try to make sure that you were protecting those 12 people to whatever degree they needed protecting so that we could get enough rental income to just kind of break even, which is pretty much our goal. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, so I think we've, oh, sorry. Oh, Mr. Uh, Malloy, thank yeah. you. Thanks, Maureen. Sure, thanks. I'm on my phone, so there's no, uh, I don't think there's any video. I'm gonna... But I, I think, you know, I think the, the scenario is, is such a, um, you know, it's kind of like when you talk about something defaulting, it's really the worst case scenario. And as Jane said, it would be pandemonium because it would affect, you know, thousands of units. So I, I don't think necessarily having a condition that addresses this, for instance, the permit would always say that um, the units are affordable in perpetuity. And you could say that it, you know, will fall on um, the voucher program or any successor program. And there's ways to kind of have, you know, some language in there. Um, and then the affordability restrictions usually have a default clause or some clause where Amherst or the local municipality or state would have an option to try to retain affordability in case something like this happened. You know, and, and that's a very expensive option, but it would, you know, it's, it's always written into affordability restrictions or it can be. So I think it'd be really difficult to craft a condition that this would be met for this, you know, because in the likely scenario, if that actually did happen, I'm not sure that can get condition could actually be met. You know, if like the voucher program just totally disappeared, you know, what, you know, what kind of condition could capture those types of scenarios? So I think the idea that there's a condition saying that the units are affordable in perpetuity and maybe have some other language in there 
um, may be sufficient. And then, you know, like I said, there's other documents that try to safeguard some of these, some of these detailed scenarios. But I think that's a really difficult scenario to capture in a condition. Good news is that unlike public housing, most of the units in this development are subsidized, as Chris was saying, at the front end and not through an ongoing source. So your public housing in Amherst is, I mean, it's probably 100% reliant upon annual subsidies. And we're partially reliant. The sad fact is that, sub, uh, that support for subsidized housing in this country over the last 40 years has dropped. And it's continues eroded. to drop. And yes. it's, it's a mere shadow of what it was before. And even the good news is even with at it being a, just a, a sliver of what it was at one time, there still are long-term commitments that are being made and being lived up to by the government, but by both state and federal governments, but it's a much smaller pot of, and pool of money that's available. It's, um, it's, it's a shame. Okay, um, so give that some thought and we'll, we can talk about it again next week, but if you can give it some thought, Mr. Maxfield, and we'll list it as one of the conditions and we'll have to you'll have to flesh it out a bit more, but um, it, it provoked a good discussion if nothing else. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts on conditions? Questions for the applicant for next week? Okay. Um, so Maureen, we're gonna have um, some conditions and waivers distributed to the members before the uh, beginning of next week. We'll wanna make sure that, that the applicant has seen, the Valley has seen some of those beforehand so that we get quick response so we can turn it around quickly to our, our members and we hope to have something to all of you uh, early, earlier in the week than later in the week. Because uh, the other thing I wanna discuss is that um, I know that um, Mr. Langsdale cannot attend the meeting on Wednesday, uh, on, on Thursday, that we're trying to have the meeting on the 7th. I think that would, it's my, Maureen, that's my understanding that that works for everybody to have the meeting on the 7th as opposed to the 8th, the Wednesday as opposed to the Thursday. Yes, that's correct. Everyone um, has indicated that they're available on Wednesday, October 7th, either. And the other and the other option is that we could start the meeting at six because I think that Ms. O'Mara's um, schedule has changed and we might be able to start it earlier and maybe um, then we could have a, th a full three hour meeting. Um, is that, Ms. O'Mara, can you meet at six on Wednesday of next week and can everybody else? Uh, definitely at six in two weeks. In two weeks, excuse me, in two weeks, yes, on the seventh. Great. Yeah, my schedule uh, is changing and I can do six o'clock. Great. Uh, Mr. Waskevitz uh, is raising his hand. Mr. Waskevitz, please. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, was the board happy with the elevations that they saw tonight, or would they like to see something a little more clear and more closer to what we're going to be seeing in the when it's actually built? Elevations of the building. And when could that happen if it is happening yeah. in the near future? That's when do you when do you anticipate providing a more detailed more detailed elevation? Well, I'll let <laughs> you, you're going to have to do it anyway, right? You're going to have to do it before it goes to the town. Yeah, we we certainly wouldn't make any revisions until we got through this zoning process because sometimes people ask us to change things. So we deliberately don't go too far down the plan the road of architectural drawings um, until we hear fully from this board. Um, yeah, we would advance plans when we're going in for funding, typically. So it would probably be this winter. So. You know, I don't know that there, there's a lot of um, interest in the details of the interior, but I think there might be some more interest in the, in the details of the exterior of the building, um, both in the community. Um, is there a way for us to, well, I guess that one of, the, one of the conditions that we may want to impose is 
is, is looking or a request we have, not, not a condition that wouldn't work, that'd be too late, is to look at uh, additional uh, elevations, or more detail on the exterior. Um, I don't want you to do something you wouldn't otherwise do, right? It's something right. you're going to have to do. And yeah. I, I can see the concern that you have about spending money that is then going to, for design that's going to subsequently change. Yeah. We don't want, but I think that you've, there hasn't been a lot of this, there hasn't been a lot of opposition to the general design. And I think it'd be beneficial it, for us and for the community to know a little bit more about the exterior design of the building. And I would, it would be helpful to us if you could come up with a more detailed exterior elevation. So there's a better feel from a better understanding of what the, uh, the building would look like. And I think that would be a benefit to the community and to us. So let me ask you this. An elevation is a two-dimensional look flat of one side of the building. It's really for builders. The rendering are those kind of 3D model kind of images that you've been seeing that give you more of a sense of the proportion, the massing, what it might really look like. I guess I'm wondering what, what would be valuable for the committee? Well, I think, I, I don't think the rendering that we saw today, which was the blue um, colored, yep. blue colored outdated since changed yeah. rendering <laughs> gives us much feel for the building at all. I mean, it, it, okay. it gives me a sense of the, of the mass it gives yep. me a sense that I like the style. It's, it seems to match with the, with the community and with other, other buildings in the area, and that's all good. Um, but I think it, it's, it doesn't give me any sense of what the building is going to look like. <laughs> if you, and I think an elevation is probably what is more, more um, appropriate and, more, and has more information. And I guess I'd ask Mr. Waskevich if that's, if I'm using the right term, or not, but I'm trying to get a feel for a better, um, I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for what the building looks like, is gonna look like from the outside. And is that, is the elevation the right way to do that or is the rendering the right way to do that? Uh, to Ms. Baker's comment, I think the rendering might be better because it gives you more of a 3D, actually more of a pictorial view of what it will look like. Yeah, an elevation is really straight on, um, but it might be nice if the board could get a, a visual of what it would look like to be standing from the road or you know that kind of thing scale wise and also what the sides facing the road will look like as you approach you know coming up route nine that kind of thing how long does it take to produce that <laughs> tom <laughs> well so just as a quick background just to explain how how we work and why there's two sets of drawings um so we we actually work in well we have a number of different platforms that we work on. But it, initially, uh, we, we have two CAD, different CAD systems. One is a um, two slightly two cross the 3D, uh, very precise CAD drafting program, which ultimately produces the, we use to produce the construction documents. Um, that is a little cumbersome during, you know, early design phases to really get an idea of how the building the, the massing of the building and be able to spin around it. So we, we go back and forth and, and use uh, a SketchUp modeling program uh, to get make, you know, to make the massing images that you saw. And generally at about this, this is sort of what I would call the schematic phase of our design. At this point, generally we shift from the SketchUp model because it's not very, it's not as, it's not really very precise um, over to the, the, uh, CAD system, which you know gives a, which is very precise drawings, and and this the CAD system that we use to um, to make the plans and elevations. So all, all, basically, all the floor plans and elevations and sections and roof plan that's all in the CAD. Um, it is possible to. I mean, we could work within the rendering and try to bring that up. Uh, you know, to reflect the the proportions and detail in, in the CAD program. Um, we generally would uh, sort of abandon that at this phase. Uh, it's more of a sort of pictorial thing. We would move on to the, I would say the real building. But the disadvantage to that is it, it, it shows the building, but it does not show the context. So it really, it's, it's, 
it shows you the, the plans and elevations and the, of the building. It does not show you uh, anymore how it, you know, how it sits in the site with, but it's a, it's a pretty extensive process to, I mean, the, the site that's in that, in our little renderings is very abstract. It's, it's a pretty, it, quite extensive process to take the, uh, carefully take the contours and the, in the plantings that we have on the site plan and get those proportionally correct into the model. Um, and the only so, issue with it is it's not something that we really use going forward. Yeah, um, so what we would be developing more would be construction drawings and they don't include renderings at all. There's no 3D look, it's all flat. Um, so we could share those at the point when we kind of are naturally kind of developing those, we can easily send those along to the board to look at at your convenience. That would, that would be after we make our decision. Right? Is that what, yeah, and that doesn't help us much with the um, moving making line, the decision, yeah. with, with the uh, decisions. Oh, yeah. Any board members? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know which one, I guess that one went out. <laughs> um, I guess, does any board member not feel this is um, an unnecessary requirement upon the applicant? Now I'm back, can you hear me now? Yeah. Does, does any board member feel this is an unnecessary um, condition on the applicant or expense to the applicant? I, I, I guess I need to clarify. Go ahead. Yep, go ahead, Ms. Parks. So I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. I, I know that for me, I don't remember seeing any renderings with the, the neighbors um, and the relationship. Is, is that, so are you asking, is that a necessary thing to see the renderings or not enough? What are you asking, yeah. Steve? I'm asking, do people think it's necessary to see further drawings before they can proceed or do, are they satisfied with what they've had so far? Dylan. It sounds like you want to see, it sounds like you want to see more um, drawings as to how it fits in the neighborhood. Is that right? That's, I, I would like to see that. When you were talking about elevations, that what is what came to my mind as it's on a sloped property. And so to be able to see the renderings, you can see what it looks like in relation to the neighbor's property with the eight foot fence and in relation to the parking lot and the, uh, I don't know, the building, yeah. the track building. Um, how about a, a section elevation instead of, um, would that uh, satisfy the board's need of showing? Um, so we've, we've, this has been requested of us and we've responded early on that this is a hugely big ask. <laughs> okay. So I just want to make sure that, and it's, it, it, to me, it feels beyond the scope of preliminary plans, which is what's required for comprehensive permit. We don't have the topographical survey data of all of our neighbors. I mean, this would probably be three to four weeks is what we said before, thousands of dollars to be able to accurately depict where these different properties are located. Um, so I, I mentioned that again. <laughs> uh, uh, Ms. Brestrup? Yes. Ms. Brestrup? Um, am I muted or not? I guess I'm not. No, so I think you could you. do a simple line drawing using GIS topo to show how this building fits in with the surrounding topography and the building up the hill um, and maybe the building down the hill too. And I've done these in, you know, in grad school and I've done them throughout my career, so they're not that expensive. Um, as long as you don't have to include an elevation with it, all you do is include the outline of the buildings and you show the, the slope via a line and you might show trees via lines and you show the fence, how tall it is. And I think you can get a pretty good uh, view of things using that method. It's, as I said, it's pretty simple and it's just a line drawing. And then I think what Mr. Waskevitz was in originally inquiring about is the suggestion that the planning board made about um, uh, altering the relationship of the um, first story with the second story with regard to that white um, panel that goes across it. And I think that could be done 
using just elevations. And so you could get a pretty good idea of what this thing is going to look like using elevation drawings and as one thing and using a simple line drawing through the site showing the showing the fence, showing the trees, whatever you're going to plant there, showing the outline of the new building and the outline of the adjacent buildings. And then the uh, ZBA could have a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like. And I don't think that would cost a lot of money. So you, you can deal with, I'll ask Rachel. So some of the buildings sit close to the road. Obviously, our building sits way back. So it becomes very small in relationship to the view along that line that you're drawing. Is that what you're talking about, Christine? You try to reflect that scale? I'm talking about a cross section and a cross section would potentially be through the building, uh, the Wilbur's house up the hill. But if it doesn't exactly go through that building, then you could sort of jog the cross section. And I think Rachel would know what to do here. It's, it's pretty easy to draw a jogged cross section line on a plan. So you know exactly where the cross section is being taken. And then you just do a simple line drawing of Wilbur's house, this building, the fence, and whatever is down the hill. We would just have to guess a little bit about the height of the other buildings. Um, yep. that's yeah, and okay. I think that's reasonable. And you have, I guess we can't um, there's, uh, we have an oblique, um, a way of looking at our buildings all throughout the town in an oblique way. And you can measure um, the buildings using a measuring tool. Maureen could probably show you how to do that. Um, sure. And it's not that difficult because I've done it and I'm not very technically savvy. So. Um, I think we could help you figure that out, how tall the buildings are. Yeah, yeah. I think a cross section through the buildings could be helpful to show height and width. Um, I think if we do a, a cross section elevation at the street, there's gonna be a lot of distortion as Laura was indicating. You know, looking at the site now, it's, it's so far back that due to perspective, um, the building looks much smaller because it's further back. Uh, than, than a house that would be closer to the road. So but that, to me, that's, if people are asking to see like what they're really gonna see, what they're really gonna see in real life is not that all these buildings are in the same plane. Right. That, you know, that one house is close to the road, it looks big, one house is set way back, it looks teeny. That's what you see. Mm -hmm. I think it would indicate though, how, what the relationship of the size is and what the yeah. relationship of the height is, if you did that kind of jogged cross section. It doesn't okay. have to be exactly what somebody would see from the road, but it would give an impression of relative height and mass. So it seems to me that, that what, what would be helpful is for Rachel and Chris and Laura to have a conversation about how this can be, how this can be accomplished. And I think it would give us more information um, and most of us, don't know what you're talking about right now. And so, I mean, we don't understand the technicalities at all, but I think you understand the kind of desire that we have for more information. So why don't we, why don't we leave it up to you guys? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, to um, staff and the applicant to come up with something over the next two weeks that does not impose a huge duty on you and a huge cost, but gives us some more information, okay? Rachel, did you wanna say one last thing? Yeah, if I could speak, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. to clarify for people who are not immersed in the in all the technical part, anything that looks photo real and like a bird flying over the site, that's very labor intensive for us. But what Christine just outlined is a very specific um, specific drawing that's measured without a lot of detail, uh, and that's something that's much much easier to achieve. So, I think I think. Just so people know, if you want it to look like a, like like real, like a photo, like you're flying around, that's that's what takes a lot of time. But what you guys described made things much easier. And then Mr. Waskevich, right. yeah, yeah. I I don't want to place a lot of burden on the applicant. Um, it was mostly just so that the board could get a better sense of what the scaling of this building is going to look like in regards to the neighborhood, but. Also, there was some conversation about uh, changing the stone line and the banding on the top of my roof, I guess, but we don't see that currently in this in what we were shown tonight. So those things probably should be updated so that we'll actually know what this is going to look like. 
the, the original can I discussing. say one thing quickly? Mr. Chalmers, yep. Yeah, the original set about. that was submitted did have a sheet with exterior elevations that had the the stone line the way the way we're proposing it that is that is different than the rendering ones. And we we can without you know we we can add we can take that those elevations. What they don't have is is very good uh, definition of the of the trim and uh, stuff. And we can add you know we can add that and get we can make those elevations realistic to to what we're proposing. Um, and that would be I think a better way to go than trying to uh, adjust the model to reflect it, which um, partly for us because we're moving forward on those drawings anyway. This part, I, so so we can take that we can take the the elevations that have the stone the way we, we are going to propose it and just flesh those out and add trim the proper trim details and everything else. Make sure the windows are the way we're, they're going to be and fascias and stuff like that. Lockler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I I think this this part of the conversation is very useful for us right now because. I think that reminding the board of some of the things we have presented to get at some of the things I'm hearing is good. Um, I think that if we are going to produce anything new, I would really like to make sure that we are not guessing at what that result will bring to the board. So any of the comments from board members are helpful for us to say, if I see this, it will help me to make this decision, uh, whatever, you know, because I think we have presented many of these things in partial um, form and at different times. So I guess I just really would like the board to be very clear about the outcome you're looking for from whatever we might produce. Thank you. Ms. Brestrup is raising her hand. So I just wanted to reiterate what Tom Chalmers said with regard to the elevations. I think if you um, if you change the elevations to reflect what the planning board asked for and whatever um, changes you wanted to make in windows and doors and things like that, that would be, that would be excellent. That would be really helpful in being able to see what this building is going to look like. And then the cross section as we talked about, and I will discuss that with um, Ms. Loeffler as we are moving forward. Okay. All right. I think I, I am comfortable relying upon staff to get to us what we what is I think the type of information that'd be helpful to make our decision. So why don't we leave it at that and, and see what you can come up with um, in the sh in a short time. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions, conditions, or requests of the applicant? We've talked about, if not, we've talked about the next meeting and the next meeting we'll be dealing with um, conditions and perhaps waivers and you'll have information from um, on that earlier in that week before the uh, in the week that we have the um, so sometime around the 4th or the 5th of October you'll be getting some information on um, on condition possible conditions. Uh, Mr. Chair uh, uh, yes. I just want to say it, it would actually be flipped. Uh, first the board would um, it would make sense for the board to review the waiver request Yes, and then, you're right. Because it could Conditions impact later. The... That's right, Marina. We talked about that and I got it turned around. We want to do the waivers first and then the conditions. Yep. Um, the last item on the agenda is the, uh, well, for, we're going to close the, we're going to, um, <laughs> we're not going to close the hearing. We're going to uh, suspend the hearing until our next meeting. Continue. We'll continue the hearing until our next meeting on October 7th um, at six o'clock. Do I have a, a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, this is a roll call vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Uh, motion carries. We will reconvene on this subject on October 7th at 6 p.m. The last item on the agenda is the uh, opportunity for public comment on any matter that is not the subject of this public hearing. Um, is there anybody who wishes to make a, a comment on a subject matter that is not the subject of this hearing? Okay. 
Okay. Um, with that, is, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Um, is there any discussion? All right. This is a, this is a roll call vote. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Motion carries unanimous. Um, thank you all for your time tonight, and we'll see you um, on a, the next meeting. Maureen is October 1st. 1st, Which right? October Thursday. 1st. Next for Thursday. For non 40B items. Yep, non 40B items. All right. Thank, thank you, you very all. much. Thanks Thank for your time. Bye-bye.